Welcome to Charity Village Connects. As Canada prepares for the second annual National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, which coincides with the Grassroots Initiated Orange Shirt Day on September 30th, we ask Indigenous leaders how the nonprofit sector can be a better partner with and support Indigenous led organizations and communities. And what should organizations and nonprofit professionals understand about their role in the journey towards reconciliation? Joining me today is Tim Fox, a member of the Blackfoot Confederacy from the Blood Reserve. As Vice President of Indigenous Relations with the Calgary Foundation, Tim supports the work of philanthropy while also facilitating an internal systems change approach. Tim co-chairs the Circle on Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada Board of Directors and was recently named a top 40 under 40 for his efforts of incorporating reconciliation and decolonization. Welcome to Charity Village Connects, Tim. Awesome. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for having me. I'd like to start from the beginning. Perhaps you could introduce our listeners to the work that you're doing at the Calgary Foundation. Yeah, for sure. In a nutshell, it's really uh, exactly what you said in the introduction. It's trying to facilitate a cultural shift, uh, ultimately an organizational cultural shift. Um, <clears throat> there was a point in uh, recent years that the organization that I'm now working for <clears throat> realized, and I would say, I would argue that the desire to mobilize the work of reconciliation has emerged all across the country. And so the Calgary Foundation was no different. There was a point though that they realized um, it was turning into the practice or the mandate of how they exist as an organization, meaning it was very transactional. It was about money. It was about trying to throw money at a problem to solve an issue and to fix some of the, the issues that were happening. And the organization quickly realized that that's really doing nothing in terms of mobilizing the work of reconciliation. And so the very word systems change, I think is very new to many sectors and many systems. It means something different depending on um, what sort of area of focus that you are working on. But ultimately what I'm trying to do is mobilize the work of reconciliation, mobilize the work of racial equity by changing our system, by changing us as an organization. I think there's a mental model that exists and there was certainly a mental model that existed for the Calgary Foundation for the most part when you're working in philanthropy and for the Calgary Foundation, that mental model was, oh, we exist to help support charity. We're doing all of this great work in the community. When I came on board, I sort of had to help lower the surface level of that realization and really amplify and surface the fact that there's a big portion of the population, specifically the First Nations, Métis and Inuit population and now racial populations who are missing out on a lot of that wealth distribution. Um, so it's it challenged our mental model. And now we are <clears throat> that now that's the work that I'm focused on. I'm trying to focus. I'm trying to incorporate a change to all operational areas of our system as an organization. So when you talk about systems change, are you talking about the manner in which the foundation approach these problems or their role in it? Is it, is, is it looking at it in a kind of more holistic way and including, including the communities that you're working with in some of those decision making or even in the way that you think about the problems? What, what do you mean by systems change? It's all of that. It's all of that. And it's also, <clears throat> it's also coming to the realization that historical context matters. The roots of how we exist as an organization are stem from inequality. They stem from systemic racism. I think for, you know, the listeners here, I would, I would invite all of them to sort of really try to unpack their own organizational script. I feel like we're entering a time where historically, the notion and the intentional efforts were to assimilate Indigenous people and racialized people. Uh, for me, and for the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I think one of the underlying messages through that work is those days are gone. We are no longer at a point where we should expect Indigenous people to adapt or to assimilate into the dominant narrative because of all of the things that we are recovering, discovering, reconciling with, trying to reconcile with, we're now asking the question, what are you going to do as a system to change? A lot of times 
our efforts and the program development rely on deficit statistics. There's an attitude and a belief that exists about Indigenous people all across the country. Many of your listeners might have been raised to believe that negative attitude and belief about who we are. I have to realize, Mary, is we've all been socially and edu educationally conditioned. We've been educationally and socially conditioned to live life in Canada specifically uh, through one lens, through one acceptable way of doing life that, that centers Western paradigm of thought and practice, Eurocentric beliefs, and that's rooted in the organizations that we are with. So that historical context matters. Um, so I'm doing everything that you're saying, but I'm also taking a deep dive into that history, unpacking what, what the design of our organization, the policies, the practices, and then trying to encourage and invite my colleagues and, like I said, all of our operational areas into ways to shift, ways to sort of transform that is more equitable, is more holistic, and includes at certain elements, Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing, specifically when it comes to supporting that specific community. Another fact of the matter is the Indigenous population is the fastest growing segment in all of Canada. So you know, whether they know it or not, all of our systems, all of our organizations have to prepare for that growth because it's a young population. They have to prepare themselves for that growth by ch changing, doing sort of, you know, auditing how they exist as an organization, identifying the problematic, harmful practices that are still incorporated, those policies, and try to find ways to systematically change is, is sort of what we're doing in a nutshell. Well, uh, certainly a reflection of the sort of transformation that Canada seems to be at least on the verge of beginning um, in terms of the sort of historical structure and the colonizational um, structures of the government and uh, and the kind of impact it had on Indigenous people and still has. Um, of course, you know, it's very topical in the news that there was the recent papal visit to Canada and the apology that was issued by the Pope. Um, and my, I'm very curious about what your thoughts are about whether that has impacted the reconciliation journey that Indigenous people in, in Canada, um, as well as uh, non-Indigenous people are on, whether it was a positive one and to whom. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about what your thoughts are about the impact of that in this sort of evolution that we're and journey that we're uh, undertaking. Well, first of all, I'm really cautious on speaking on behalf of the entire Indigenous population. That's not my intention in this response. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm happy to share my personal reflections, though. And um, I attended. I attended that Papal visit, and I was in Moscow Chiefs uh, that day. He provided that apology. How I ended up there was um, as part of my role at the Calgary Foundation. I'm also invited to be a part of many community groups. I think that's a really crucial way of maintaining connections to the urban Indigenous community and surrounding Treaty 7 areas as well. And so one of the spaces I'm a part of and lucky to be a part of is uh, with St. Mary's University. They have an Indigenous Advisory Committee and I'm a, I'm a part of that. I'm actually co-chairing that as, as well, along with my colleague Michelle Scott, who's there. And uh, Michelle reached out one day, um, probably very close to that visit, maybe a, a week or two before the visit. And uh, you know, just shared that she was invited to put a delegation of 13 uh, representatives together to attend the visit and witness the apology, uh, witness the, all of the sites that he was going to, you know, be visiting in his, in that time. And to be honest, when she reached out, you know, I didn't respond right away. And my initial gut reaction was, I don't really care to go. I wasn't interested in going at all. Um, one thing I want to share is that I was raised Catholic. The Catholic faith was really strong in my family. Uh, my late grandmother had a huge hand in raising me, and she was a very devout um, Catholic, as well as my aunt Bernadette, who I consider you know my second mom. So it was very prominent in our family, um, <clears throat> and that was sort of the faith that I was raised raised to believe. It wasn't until I became very aware of the residential school system. It wasn't until, you know, I think I was in my late teens that I, that I began to 
really find out about what that meant. And then furthermore, discovered that both of my parents went to residential schools, that the school on our reserve, on the Blood Reserve, St. Mary's residential school was still st a still standing structure as well as St. Paul's. So I began to realize all of these things. And then fast forward a little bit more into my young adult life, you begin to sort of realize and make a lot of connections to the challenges that you're faced with as an Indigenous person. And I began to have that realization as a young adult. I grew up with a lot of challenges, grew up, um, you know, exposed to a lot of substance abuse in my father, a lot of extreme domestic violence issues. And so just a lot of resent. Um, and um, the realization that I had was that the experiences that I went through as a child were just a fraction of what my parents had to go through as children because of their time at the residential school system. Then I started to learn about brain development for human beings and began to realize that who we become as adults isn't just the result of the people who raised us. Who we become as adults is the result of our life experiences, both positive and negative life experiences. And there's a crucial time in every human's life that is crucial for brain development, and that's in early childhood years. <clears throat> so I started to piece all of this stuff together. And then, you know, that's where my, my decision to step away from the Catholic faith emerged. And I began to lean into my Indigenous spirituality more so. And so when that invitation came to partake in this visit, I wasn't excited. Um, I co-parent my daughter, who was 11 years old, and it just so happened that I was going to be um, caring for her that week. And um, I thought, it, so then after giving it some thought, I decided, yeah, I'm going to go. It's a historical thing. There's probably going to be some survivors within the delegation that I can maybe offer some support to along the way. So that was my decision. And I presented this to my 11 year old daughter to say, oh, hey, you know, we're going to be attending this Pope visit. Um, and to my surprise, she also really clearly expressed the fact that she did not want to attend. And I thought it was because it was a work-related trip, all this kind of stuff. So after um, ask, inquiring a little bit more with her and just trying to figure out what, why she was so against this trip, it was, it was because of the fact that it was the Pope and because of her grandparents, her papa, my father, her grandma. So she knows that they're both residential school survivors. That conversation is happening a lot more, thankfully, um, in school these days that she is aware of um, the severity of that part of our shared history. And she was not excited for that very reason. So in a way I was, I was a little, you know, I was kind of proud that she, the mind of 11 year old had um, that context to make that decision that she did not want to attend. When I did attend, um, <clears throat> it was everything I think I had anticipated it to be. Um, I think, and I've seen, past Pope's visit. I, I was, I was at a 2012 pilgrimage, um, with my aunt who was very devout in her Catholic faith at the time. And there was a huge difference from this visit to, uh, the visit that I remember in 2012, <clears throat> there was a lot of attention and excitement around the visit itself and around the Pope itself. This time it wasn't, um, it wasn't filled with that that excitement. There wasn't that excite, excited feeling. There was a feeling of an anticipation on what he was going to say um, more so. And so when it was finally delivered, I guess the words that were spoken when you are someone with lived experience, for my experience, when I was, when I was in that same space as him and when I heard these words, it hit pretty hard. It sort of surfaced a lot of emotion, started to think about my own life experience. My parents specifically came to my mind. So it was very emotional. It was a very emotional experience for myself. After reflecting after that day <clears throat> with our group, I came to learn that none of us wanted to attend the delegation. Our initial thought was we did not want to go. For some reason, we all agreed to go and we came together. So <clears throat> the support and the community of kin that was created with the 13 uh, participants that did attend is sort of just a reflection of how the Indigenous community, in my mind, um, has existed always. There are so many values of kindness, humility, and respect that we are raised with. And through these efforts, there was an attempted disruption to our cultural ways, to that way of life. But thankfully, it's, it survived and it really emerged 
and my visit with the delegation that I was with, I don't think the apology was for me. I think the apology was for a lot of these survivors and hopefully some of them, you know, got what they needed, got the healing that they needed. But I do know that there are many others who um, are just waiting to see what happens next. I think an apology is, you know, rooted with a lot of language, a lot of words. Um, I have to really amplify a message that Cindy Blackstock gave after that apology that that's fine and all, but the real proof of change and transformation is what happens next. What is the that organization of the Catholic Church going to do next? Because there's still a lot of unanswered questions. There's still a lot of requests from our community on things that we need to move forward in, in, a, in a way that's rooted in reconciliation, that's rooted in right relationship and ultimately rooted in healing and not only healing for the indigenous people, because I think framing it in that way, that it's the indigenous community that has to heal or that this history of the residential school is the, is indigenous history. I want your listeners to know that, no, it's not only the indigenous community that has to heal. It's also settler nations and those people who were raised within that time, because if they're learning about this for the first time, then they should really be asking themselves, what part did my ancestors, ancestors play? in this um, really damaging, harmful history, and then what can I do moving forward? Um, and know that this is not Indigenous history. This is a part of the very deep, dark, hidden past of Canadian history. Um, I'm moved by your description, at least as I understand it, that um, w if good came from the apology, it was your sense of community among your people and, and the possible healing that may be felt by some of the survivors of the school. And, uh, and am I understanding you correctly? Yeah. But when I say, when I say that apology was not for me, what I mean for me, there were things that were missing. There were acknowledgements that were missing. Um, I, a, a part of the work that I do with the Calgary foundation is I design and I facilitate some really, um, challenging conversations. What, what other people would, would see as challenging conversations. I see them as very liberating because I'm talking about impacts of intergenerational trauma. I'm talking about brain development. I'm, I'm amplifying everything that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is calling on all Canadians to do is to, is to really embrace this truth-telling movement. So I'm doing all of those things, but I'm also doing a level of sense-making. I think the information today is so accessible. You just need to go on Google and you can find out about the residential schools or the 60 Scoop. I think where people struggle is that sense-making piece. Okay, so. I see this, I'm hearing this, I'm learning this, but what now? Like why they don't really see that connection on how these impacts are still um, felt and experienced by indigenous people and Canadian society in general. I think you need to really consider these external factors that are happening. And we hear about, you know, disputes with Mi'kma'ki fishermen and the that dispute that was going on where, you know, the First Nations community in Mi'kmaq territory just wanted to to get access to their traditional lands for a basic livelihood. And they were being met with, you know, aggression and all this kind of stuff. And you see, you know, you hear about stories about a, an indigenous grandfather going into a bank in Vancouver, trying to open up a bank account with his 15 year old granddaughter. And then he is being arrested and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So that's how it still permeates within the fabric of our society. And like people, I don't think people really understand that. All you got to do is walk downtown any major urban center and you'll see indigenous people struggling with poverty substance abuse all of these impacts and quite frankly we didn't get to that point on our own it was by strategic design um the whole point initially of the residential school system of the indian act was to erase us was to get rid of the indian problem and that still sort of is rooted in unconscious biases a lot these days and so that apology wasn't for me because he missed a lot of things. He didn't acknowledge the sexual abuse that occurred. He didn't sort of take uh, responsibility in my mind as a system, as a Catholic faith system that was sort of missing. So I think, I think um, those words were very strategically designed. And I would say I would have the same criticism from the 2008 apology from the then prime minister to Canadians and residential school survivors that Frankly, they didn't really write those words, but still they intentionally, strategically left out a lot of 
the accountability that I was sort of seeking. So it wasn't for me. I didn't hear a lot of things that I was hoping to hear. And again, it's it, the proof is going to lie in what happens next. So looking at what happens next, I, I'd like to return to your work with the foundation. And certainly the foundation's been very public about having been on this journey towards reconciliation since 2015. Can you discuss what that process has looked like for the foundation and the work that's been done uh, that other organizations might actually learn from to make these more concrete steps that you are referring to? Yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> it's really been an evolution of things that have occurred. I think when we refer to um, the the work being born in that year of 2015, um, nothing was really being done. We had a lot of realizations in that year. One of the realizations um, was that we weren't reaching um, the enough communities. So there was there was communities that were being left out and how we stewarded our funds and all that kind of stuff. So that was a realization that we had in 2015. Because that year is so significant for that realization is because that was the year that the Truth and Reconciliation released its 94 calls to action to all Canadians. So a lot of things were happening. Um, the Calgary Foundation definitely was paying attention to these things that were happening. And then, like I said, because they didn't know any better, uh, because they were sort of operating on how we existed as an organization and our mandate is to support the charitable sector, build an endowment, support the charitable sector. Um, that's what we did. We designated, I think it was like $1.8 million to go to indigenous youth specific programs back in 2015. We were also finding ourselves in spaces or from what I know, because I wasn't here at the time, but um, from what I'm understanding, the organization and senior leadership found themselves in spaces listening to other leaders like, you know, Phil Fontaine and uh, Perry Belgard and all of these other people, Marie Sinclair, the commissioners themselves, who were inviting everyone to this call to action. And so that's where it began in 2015. What, what then evolved was um, the board of directors uh, and representation matters, Mary, I want to say that because I'm not sure we have a, at the time we have, and we still have, he's our current chair of our board at the Calgary Foundation, John Fisher. He's, he's of indig indigenous ancestry himself, who was crucial in um, encouraging the board at the time to take a deep dive into some learning. And they did that through things like the blanket exercise experience. They started to invite deeper levels of understanding when it comes to TRC. And then all of a sudden, in 2017, they convened a group of leaders here in Calgary, a group of Indigenous leaders, and they said, hey, you know, this is what we're learning. We're finding that just by providing, you know, sums of money, be, having it being a transactional relationship isn't doing anything for us as an organization around reconciliation. What do you suggest we do? And those leaders said, you really have to change um, and transform what you're doing right now. And so they decided to bring someone on board and invite them to really explore and unpack what systems change for reconciliation looked like. So when I came on board in 2017, I didn't necessarily know what I was doing. I did know that there was a piece of context that was missing. And in the back of my mind, I had an idea of what things, what things in terms of our practices and policies could be changed and shifted, but it didn't sit well with me to come in as a senior le level leader, heavy handed to say, oh, this change has to happen. This change has to happen. I wanted that to come naturally. So then I began the, the tough work of designing and mobilizing a lot of really crucial context in that sense making piece that has since become a part of our competencies as an organization. It's weaved right into our professional development. So all of our staff are evaluated on their performance year after year. I'm sure it's like that for many organizations. So when you ask me, what can other organizations do? <clears throat> has come to the realization that um, we have to really embrace this truth-telling movement and you have to really weave this information and this context within the fabric of how you operate as an organization. And then if you can take it a step further, begin to weave it into the performance um, evaluations that your staff uphold, because then it becomes a responsibility and the accountability of these staff and not just the one person who's invited to help facilitate this process or to facilitate the system change. So it, it's a lot more, um, there's a lot more to it, Mary, than, than what I'm explaining. Uh, but I think it, just in the time that we have, that's essentially what it's about. It's about facilitating some change in, in all areas of how you operate and exist as a system, as an organization. 
and really sort of leaning into a lot of this truth and paralleling it to how you operate as an organization or as an entity is, is the best that I can. And, and I'm not, I'm not about to say that that's the solution for every organization. Cause like I said, it's going to be different for everyone, but that's the, the approach that we we've taken. And it has proved since 2017 to be really transformational. It has proved to help increase and strengthen our own relationships with specifically treaty seven communities, because the Calgary foundation, is located within the bioregion of the Six Gates to beat the Blackfoot Confederacy. So obviously um, the connections that we would pursue and uh, the catchment area that we sort of are trying to embrace is the Treaty 7 area of Southern Alberta. I, I guess, I mean, that certainly describes the way that your organization um, as a foundation has sort of transformed itself. I'd like to look a little bit in terms of the kind of external work that, um, that we are that the foundation might be doing and the manner in which that might have changed as well. Um, but in particular, when we look at, I guess, statistics about um, the kinds of funds that have become available to um, more uh, indigenous led communities through foundations in an article from uh, 2021, the data suggested that indigenous led organizations received only 0.05%, which is half a percent of funds given out by charities in 2018 in Canada. Um, this is just a shocking, shameful number, um, the way I see it. Can you speak to this reality? And in your mind, what needs to be done to get the sector to prioritize giving uh, into Indigenous organizations and communities and understanding that despite the kind of attention that, um, that uh, finally um, indigenous communities have uh, at least had a bit of light shine shone upon them recently that these are still the kind of um, really shocking uh, uh, levels of support given by charities uh, to these communities. Uh, what are your thoughts around that? In, in the context of wealth distribution and in the context of philanthropy specifically, that statistic is very accurate, I think, from a broad sense. Locally, and from the Calgary Foundation's perspective, I'm sort of happy to share that that percentage has increased in the last five years that we've been really focused on this work. And just recently, this past year, we gave a historical $1 million major and signature grant to the Blood Reserve for the uh, redevelopment of their Red Crow Community College, which so happened to be housed within a former residential school itself, and it burnt down a, f a number of years ago. Since then, they have been pursuing um, fundraising efforts to rebuild that structure as an institution and begin and continue to provide those post-secondary post opportunities for nation members. And they came to us early, sorry, late in 2021 through our major and signature grants um, envelope and opportunity of funding. And thankfully, our major and signature grants had Grants Committee had been doing this work alongside every one of our volunteers, every one of our staff and board members. So essentially they had sort of the context and um, no, in, throughout our history, no community foundation has ever given that sum of money to a First Nations community. So that's the context of um, philanthropy. So it has, it has shifted. We, I am seeing and I'm noticing a lot more. If you want to talk numbers, I can share that, you know, in the last few years, the percentage of funds that went to First Nations communities and Indigenous-led efforts from the Calgary Foundation is somewhere around 2.37% around that. So we're experiencing a growth. And it's also related, I, I like to amplify the kinds of projects that we're supporting. So another example is we're supporting the Bison Return Project for the Blood Reserve, where leadership from that community and elders were able to sit down with folks from stakeholders from the Calgary Foundation to really explain the economic and cultural benefit of having bison return back to communities, all of that kind of stuff. And, and so that that's what I want to share. <clears throat> I also want to share, um, I think organizations, specifically philanthropic organizations really have to understand that there's diversity within our nations. There's also diversity within how we view or perceive indigenous led, um, indigenous serving and first nations communities itself. So. You know, we fall under charity law, 
which you know tells us that we can only grant to those organizations and entities that are doing charitable activity uh, with a charitable number. Of course, there are many other organizations that fall under not-for-profit status, society status, all that kind of stuff. So we're bound a little bit to who we can directly support. I'm not sure that it's really well known that also First Nations communities are qualified donees themselves if they go through the very paternalistic steps that the federal government has laid out in order to get on that to that list. And so we did our research, we did the hard work of identifying which Treaty 7 First Nations communities were qualified donees. Turns out all of them are, except for the Begani Nation. And then we sort of hit the ground running to do outreach, 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 saying this is who we are. Let's um, have a conversation. We began to form and strengthen relationships with each one of these nations where they now um, know about us and they're they're invited to come to us for these opportunities. So I think it's a lack of awareness, both on the part of philanthropic organizations and then also on the First Nations communities surrounding whatever entity it is that, you know, these are, this is who we are, this is why we exist to support communities. So I realized that in early days, then I sort of tried to facilitate that awareness raising effort on, on both sides. And since then, it's flourished, it's grown. We now have really strong contacts on First Nations communities. The staff know about protocol. They know about um, the, the diversity that exists within Treaty 7. So we had to do a lot of work and that work continues and all that kind of stuff. But what <clears throat> the, the, other, the other mental model that we were challenging before I came on board was that they believed that they were honestly supporting indigenous led efforts. And when we sort of unpacked that a little bit more, we realized that we were supporting settler created organizations that had an envelope or a focus, a small portion of service or programs provided to the indigenous community. They weren't necessarily providing it to indigenous led organizations or First Nations communities. So that distinction really has to be understood. And I did watch the interview that you, um, the conversation that you had with Chris Archie at The Circle and the I4DM tool that she talks about um, is a huge compliment to sort of this understanding. And so, um, you know, just kudos and a shout out to The Circle on the resources that they're developing because that's exactly what's missing in terms of um, how we operate and exist as settler created organizations, that understanding of who is indigenous led, what is the difference and uh, you know, where is the gap happening for First Nations communities themselves? Well, you, uh, you recently, uh, you, you actually uh, mentioned the sort of uh, challenges that the existing sort of charitable system uh, creates in actually supporting um, indigenous indigenous led communities that may well not be um, qualified donees under the present law. We recently aired an episode on what was at that time called Bill S216, which has now been passed in essence as part of the 2022 budget in Bill C19. And uh, the part of the, the uh, you know, the, the whole initiative behind this uh, particular um, legislation was to change this to, to make the the rules more flexible so that um, so that charitable organizations could better more easily work with uh, what would technically in for, under the former law be seen as non qualified donees and work more directly potentially with uh, community led organizations and I, I I would love to hear your thoughts on this legislation and, and how it might impact your work at the foundation. Uh, do you think it'll make a, a significant difference in the, in the way that you can work with um, indigenous communities in the future? In, in all honesty, Mary, no, it's not going to make a difference to how we are trying to be more equitable in how we operate and exist as an organization. <clears throat> do I believe that legislation and laws like that are discriminatory and rooted in inequality? Absolutely. Do I also believe that there are many other laws and policies that exist that should be revisited, revised, thrown out altogether? Absolutely. I don't want to give the message that this work can't be done without doing that. It could absolutely be done. We're doing it. There are many other examples. I don't want people to sort of use that as a, as another excuse to, to be like, well, it's it's limiting us to do this. And there are ways, there are ways we can work with community. Um, and, you know, when I think about philanthropy from 
when I think about the indigenous community and how I was raised on the blood reserve and even how I exist in th these contemporary times, when you see, and when you're a part of an indigenous community and when you are, have these strong relationships, you're going to witness this community of kin. What I mean by that is we become sort of this family. Our family concept from an Indigenous perspective goes beyond the biological connection that we have to our parents. It extends to that extended family. And that that is definitely true in how we exist as communities. It exists in how we sort of practice our philanthropy. And so previously to settler created philanthropy, our, our mindset was to care for everyone. Um, it was to care, make sure and ensure that everyone had what they needed when we sort of <clears throat> did the things that we did to survive. And now in this day and age, what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do is and what I'm witnessing is that that's coming to life. That paradigm of practice is coming to life. Philanthropy for us at the Calgary Foundation just doesn't mean wealth distribution. It also means how are we convening people? How are we sitting in relationship with one another? We're trying to amplify um, and be innovative of, on, on how we practice our philanthropy. When I say innovative, I don't mean something new. I mean, these old ways, how are we looking back at these old ways, bringing them back to this contemporary time? And so for me, those laws need to be revised. Frankly, there should be a whole audit done on how the structure of the federal government operates specifically when it comes to first nations support and all that kind of stuff. But no, that's not a conversation. <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is this work can happen right now. Um, and it should be happening right now. There are ways for organizations to adapt, to shift, to support other partner opportunities, collaborative efforts. There are ways that they can increase the wealth distribution. They don't have to wait for a lot to change. You can make that organizationally yourselves. And this is, this is what I'm experiencing and witnessing here at the Calgary Foundation. And that's not like Tim Fox doing this, saying we need to increase this way, we need to change this, we need to do all that kind of stuff. All of this transformation is happening from the colleagues that I work with based on this systems change approach that I'm trying to facilitate and embed within the fabric of how we understand, how we show up as individuals, and then how that permeates into the roles that we hold here as an organization. So, you know, I don't mean to say that this is the end all be all, or this is the step-by-step -step guide and way to do this, because frankly, I'm still learning every day. I'm learning, I'm growing. Um, there's a difference for me between knowledge extraction and knowledge mobilization. Many times people take this approach, they access, you know, podcasts like this, they access workshops, merely with the intention to increase their level of understanding. I think, if you're doing that, just to increase your level of understanding, you're being no less extractive than efforts before you. It's how are you going to mobilize what you're learning? How are your listeners going to mobilize what I'm talking about today to sort of, yeah, increase your level of understanding for sure, but then do something with that knowledge, do something different. Um, there are things that you can do daily, weekly, monthly, annually, um, and you can then embed those within your practice. So knowledge mobilization versus knowledge extraction absolutely these, these laws have to change but it's it's very possible to begin doing this work right now and frankly you should be doing this work right now well to that point i, I understand that the foundation has adjusted uh its grant making process to include the unique experience of indigenous people maybe you could talk about what this looks like in practice and and how the foundation works to um, share decision making power for example in terms of of how those changes have been made within the foundation. Yeah, well, we're trying to lean into this notion of reciprocity. So a mutual value exchange um, <clears throat> when it comes to how we engage and build and strengthen our relationship with uh, Indigenous communities, that's First Nations communities, Métis communities, um, Indigenous led charities, all that kind of stuff. So that's sort of the, the theme of reciprocity that we really want to try to um, surface and amplify in how we exist and in, in our in relationship. So a couple of years into the work that we were so focused on systems change a couple of years into that work, the grants team uh, proposed that we explore the opportunity of oral applications and 
a layer deeper than that, oral evaluation processes. We, um, <clears throat> we're reconciling with a lot. We're reconciling with the fact that we, you know, are stewards of a lot of wealth. Um, and we're also reconciling with the fact that the roots of how we exist as an organization have come from power and privilege. And so we're trying to, we're trying to sort of move forward in a way that's rooted in decolonization. And so our grants team recognized that the written language is amplified, the written language is upheld in all of society. It's a Western sort of perspective. And they said, why don't we experiment with offering First Nations communities and Indigenous led efforts specifically, the opportunity to access um, us and create a partnership for uh, fund opportunities orally. And so we said, yeah, we sort of put together the mechanisms uh, for that to happen. We launched the messaging around that. And then uh, lo and behold, a couple of entities, a community, a First Nations community and an, an Indigenous led charity uh, wanted to access that way of applying for funds. And so we really left it up to them to sort of um, set up how that would work and we sort of just took the wisdom and the insights of that of those, those entities on how would you want to do this one of them invited us into their space um where they engaged us in you know a circle practice of um staff um users uh you know clients that they would be working with and elders where we and and ourselves as as foundation representatives and we sort of just listen and I, I you know i had to be clear to them that we we as a western settler organization still required that tangible written sort of word and and, and if they were okay we were going to, we were going to do that labor we required it why why are we putting that of which we require on the shoulders and responsibility of these people who are trying to do the good work that we want to support so we, they were fine with that myself and my colleague Matt Blau um, here set in circle and uh, just sort of captured the impact of the work that they were going to be doing, the work that they were proposing for us for, you know, it contributed to healing efforts of the people that they served and the broader community, the broader, you know, community of Calgary providing cultural opportunities to them for the First Nations community. It was rooted in um, amplifying and preserving um, cultural ways and indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing and all that kind of stuff. So we sort of really left it up to them to um, direct us on how we would receive this information orally. And then simultaneously, when it came reporting time or impact time, of course, we have to be accountable to those funds ourselves. But we require that. <clears throat> Why are we then making these people who have essentially um, had a lot of land stolen and some of that land has contributed to the wealth growth that we are experiencing as an organization. So it just really didn't sit well with me to continue to um, only uphold a written application and reports and all that kind of stuff. And so since then, it's become customary and a part of our practice to offer oral applications and oral evaluation processes specifically to First Nations communities and Indigenous led charities. That is a, a really fascinating and um inspiring story um because to me you're not only supporting the you know the oral traditions um of, of the indigenous people you're you're working with but also um i imagine that um as a settler organization to be able to have a much more personal sort of intimate understanding of both the impact of the work and the people that um, would be supported by this would be really um, foundational uh, for the for the foundation to be able to look at how it can put a new lens towards measuring the success of what they're doing. Can we? Um, I I would love to hear your feelings about that sort of transformation and and um, what that means to you in your role. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I think it's pretty profound. Um, I think, I think some of the understanding from some of my colleagues and maybe even some people from our board of directors was 
you know, historically, I think an effort has always been made to incorporate Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing, but all too often do is a person hired or a team is hired who might be Indigenous themselves, and all of a sudden that work is, is siloed. It's like, okay, you have to sit over here and you do this work for your community in a very siloed way. And that's been my experience in the past is that, you know, you have Indigenous initiatives over here and then everything else over here. So when I came and I accepted this, the task of this role that I'm now in, I didn't want to silo the work. I wanted to sort of embed it throughout every, every area. And so when, when I say that it's profound to me, it's a really profound thing to witness how my colleagues here at the foundation and even the board of directors who, um, you know, part of my role is to be in spaces with them and work with them as well. That individual transformation that's happening uh, for them. And that I'm only one person. There's no possible way that I could be at all of these tables when it comes to our collaborative granting processes through major and signature grants, through community grants, through neighborhood grants, through all of these tables. But it's emerging in transformational ways because of the stewards, these colleagues that I'm working with, because of the board. And so when I talk about context setting, embedding it with the fabric, and that takes time and designing and facilitating and all this kind of stuff, to me, that's a systems change approach. One of the crucial ways to change a system is when you change attitudes and beliefs. That sounds really straightforward. And like I said, the information is so accessible these days. It could be easy for me to sort of just send my colleagues away to this online platform to do this kind of thing. But we have made a commitment to this work. I am provided the resources I need to create some really impactful experiences that is now embedded, like I said, as a competency uh, for us as an organization. And so you'll notice on every Calgary Foundation job posting, it doesn't matter what we're hiring for. The first thing you're going to read is our commitment to reconciliation and racial equity. It doesn't mean to say that these potential applicants have to be experts in that, but they do have to realize that they're applying to an organization that upholds this and it's going to be very much a part of their role, whatever their role is. It could be donor relations. It could be granting administration, impact investing, even administration. They're going to be a part of this. And that, that in that interview process, that allows us to explain that um, in deeper detail. And for the most part, and most recently, some of the positions that we have hired on for have applied to us for that very reason, um, because we are so open to trying to really mobilize this work in an impactful way, in, in a way that is demonstrating some change. This conversation around equality and reconciliation and racial equity is not a new conversation for Indigenous people or racialized people. The only reason why it's getting so much attention is because of the external factors and unfortunate incidences that have had to take place publicly um, that is now being captured all over society. I want people to know this isn't new work for us. We have been prepared to sort of move this work along and now it's being surfaced, it's being amplified. Um, you're hearing about it a lot more, but it's still very new. So there's still a lot of work to do to embed that within the fabric of our knowledge systems. So when, I guess it is as an example, is this an example um, of the, when you mentioned that we can't wait for the laws to change in order to change the way that we do things um, and, and to do the work? Is this an example of what you meant by that? Exactly. <clears throat> I think the work and the desire from what, what society would call vulnerable communities or equity deserving communities. Um, I learn a lot from the colleagues that I work with and the lesson that's been taught to me through a colleague of mine, Bina Patel tells, you know, shares that we're not vulnerable communities. It's these systems that make us vulnerable. And so, you know, we have the ability, if you, if organizations really want to change, if they really want to sort of do this kind of stuff, there are ways that they can do that right now. There are ways that need to be done. Frankly, it's become a level of urgency. I think in a lot of ways that's costing humanity. Um, and so I'm just really, you know, honored to be put in this role where I have a chance, the smallest chance. And I'm not that naive to think that in my lifetime, I'm going to see what reconciliation could look like because that requires some significant change and change that's outside of the scope of what Calgary Foundation has the power to do. 
So I'm not that naive to think that. What I am excited though about is that we are a small piece of this larger puzzle who's trying to do our part and um, really happy to sort of be in the space where I can share my story. And I have shared the story many times and hopefully it's landing with people and um, that they're sort of trying to find ways to, to mobilize it themselves because although I do like, you know, sharing this kind of space and sharing insights and my experiences, I don't claim to be an expert in any of this kind of stuff. I'm still just learning about, I think what I would say is that organizations should really learn about and take a deep dive into what systems change is because we're doing that simultaneously. And then we're sort of paralleling our understanding of what systems change is. What does it take to change a system? And there are many examples that you can use on systems that have changed. Netflix, like we use Netflix as an example. And what was before Netflix? It was blockbuster. And so there's this systems change ideology called the adaptive cycle that sort of amplifies what happened there. So there's something that happened there. And so it's no different from how we're understanding systems change from a charitable perspective and not-for-profit perspective. And then here I am, I'm also weaving in the lens of reconciliation and now weaving in the lens of racial equity. So we're understanding both things. When it comes to charity, and I know this is Charity Village podcast, the roots of charity are very harmful. The residential school system was an act of charity. So we're sort of unpacking a lot of that stuff and we're trying to change that narrative. But first we're coming to the understanding of where this comes from. Why is it we are holding on to this belief and then how can we sort of share that that transition and that understanding, that sense-making piece within all of our spheres of influence. When, when I'm doing this work with my colleagues here, I'm encouraging them to go home at the end of the day and talk about this with their families, talk about it with their, their community groups, those clubs that they're a part of, their faith groups, but then ultimately try to think of ways that they can transform when it comes to the workplace and the work that we're doing. So I'd like to go back to the bigger picture and, and, and get your comments on what you think non-Indigenous organizations can do uh, to support the National Truth and Reconciliation Day this year. Um, you know, I've spoken to other Indigenous leaders who say it's not about a day, and I think that's sort of it should be clear that it's not just about a day, it's about what should be done year round. But what would you say would be the, at least the starting points, the, the, the important concrete steps that organizations could take um, regarding uh, the National Truth and Reconciliation to, to make it meaningful in, a, in, a, in I guess, a, a, uh, uh, a practical and, and impactful way? We conducted a racial equity audit late last year in 2021. One of the recommendations that came out of that audit was to um, create sort of spaces that were um, meant for racialized perspectives, specifically when it comes to our work. And so we've done that in a couple of ways. And one of the ways that we've done that is by creating a community of practice. So through the pandemic, um, within our application uh, processes to access funding, a question that we ask these charities is, are you doing anything uh, in the space of reconciliation or racial equity. And if you're not, would you have an interest in uh, becoming a part of this community of practice? And so they would indicate yes or no. And uh, we sort of collected the data from that. We developed a distribution list and we convened that group of interested charitable partners, not-for-profit organizations who indicated an interest in September. We brought them together for the first time. <clears throat> and then that created our community of practice. We've since met with them for, we, we meet with them seasonally, so four times a year, and we focus on a topic every, every, every time. We also wanted to provide um, accountable circles for them. We wanted them to be accountable to this work. So we said, we're okay facilitating designing our time together seasonally, but we're, we're also encouraging you and we're challenging you all to meet on your own volition, on your own will, on certain topics. One of those topics that emerged from that group was the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation because it was just launched last, last September. So the question that you're asking me was a question that they had as well. Since then, that community of practice group, which consists of about 45 to 50 charities, has created smaller accountability circles. And one of those accountability circles is focused on reconciliation and the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And they've been meeting as their own accountability circle without Tim there. And they're, for the most part, 
non-Indigenous settler um, people who have settler ancestry who are coming together and they're developing these resources. They're having a conversation on things that they can do internally in and between and throughout the whole year. Um, they've created a huge resource list that we sort of shared with um, the rest of the community of practice because that was a, a question that came up in our last community of practice meeting, which focused on race-based data, um, that kind of stuff. And so I don't, I don't know what, what they can do. I agree that they should be doing something outside of just that one day. <clears throat> that one day is meant um, to, to amplify and to acknowledge for me the significance around raising awareness about the harm that has been inflicted. It, you know, we don't have, we have no problems with a day to remember on Remembrance Day. We have no problems with a day to, you know, remember tragedies like 9-11 and other things that have, that have occurred within our history. The moment someone starts talking about remembrance around truth and reconciliation, that's when it's problematic and that's what needs to shift. And so absolutely there are things that people should be doing all throughout the year. Connect with your Indigenous community. You know, I'm happy that I have really strong connections to the community. I know what community events are happening throughout the year. I know who is who and who's offering this opportunity, that opportunity. But Mary, I didn't have the luxury to go to a Tim Fox and say, hey, what can I do? What, what I found myself, I found myself in community. So my message to your listeners is find yourself in community. Chances are wherever you are, there's a really strong urban indigenous and surrounding First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities. Find yourself in those spaces. If you're a settler, a person who identifies a settler ancestry from the dominant narrative, find yourself in spaces where you're the minority. And you'll find that um, you're going to be welcomed because one of our values is kindness and hope and throughout all of this work, some of the most angry, challenged people should be these residential school survivors, but you sit in a space with an elder, they will, the generosity that they provide by telling their story sometimes in detail um, is something we can all learn, that forgiveness and humility. So we have a lot to learn from those people, but find yourself in community. Your contribution to this discussion is so helpful for our audience, and, and thank you very much for your uh, generosity of your time and and uh, in sharing your your story. Absolutely, Mary. I was happy to. I was excited to have this conversation, and thank you for the invitation to um, to share so much perspectives in my story.